days. Now, uh, last class, I did a whole lot of talking about the triumph of business values in America in the 1920s. Remember, in the 1920s, America was doing pretty well. The Europeans had been destroyed by World War I. American industry was going strong. European farmers, their farmland had been destroyed in World War I, but American farmers were going strong. America did well from World War I. Business expanded, people went to work, and consequently, the combination of business doing so well and people being so exhausted by the government's intervention in the economy under the progressive presidents from a previous generation, in the 1920s, you saw this period of conservative backlash. Governments were run by the Republican Party. They did not interfere in the economy. They basically said, business knows what it's doing, don't interfere. Because business, when it's left on its own, it makes money, everybody's got a job, and the American consumer benefits. So that was the 1920s. Unions, destroyed. Socialist movements, destroyed. Eugene Debs, the head of the Socialist Party, thrown in jail. If you weren't pro-America, pro-capitalist, pro-business, you were considered unpatriotic and a danger. This conservative backlash takes us right the way up into the culture wars. There was a conservative backlash broadly in culture. And you can see this. Does anybody ever watch, has anybody ever seen on TV or video or anything, those evangelical preachers that stand on a stage in front of hundreds and thousands of audiences and they're walking around with wireless mics and they're just, you know, you know, they're, it's pretty exciting stuff. You know what I'm talking about? The, the big evangelical preachers? You don't know what I'm talking about, do you? All right. Hmm. Imagine one guy. Take any church service that you're familiar with, whether you've been to it or you've seen it on TV or you heard about it. And then take that minister, that pastor, stick him in the middle of Madison Square Garden, fill Madison Square Garden with thousands of people that are hanging on his every word, that's evangelical preaching. That's the guy from Texas. What's that? Joel, Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen is only the most recent and the most attractive version of. And I suspect that's part of the reason why he has such a fan base. Previous evangelical preachers tended to be not that attractive. But I digress. So, during this period, I also talked last class that women were also demanding more rights. They already got the vote, and thereafter, they didn't have a clear idea politically what they wanted next, but they certainly wanted to be free of conservative restraints, work where they wanted, go out where they wanted, not being accompanied by a man, dress the way they wanted, shorter skirts, cut their hair, smoke, without it being... Women were essentially demanding to act and be treated as they wanted, and not be categorized as loose, a prostitute, whatever the case may be. Now, this kind of, and remember, this was also the period of the rise of the celebrity culture, the expansion of Hollywood movies, and so on and so forth. There was a group in America that felt the culture of America was becoming too decadent at this time, too liberal, too permissive. And so, with all this money being made, there was a change for the worse that was happening. Part of it was all these people coming over that we couldn't understand. Who the hell are these Italians and these Russians and these Poles and these Jews with their different religious customs and languages and foods? I don't want them here. They're diluting what America is. Plus, where are these people now living? In the cities in the working class slums. They're making the cities dangerous and dirty. They're ruining America.
the manifestation of all of this was the very first evangelical preacher that denounced the modern era with its immigration and different religions and new sexual cultures. Billy Sunday was his name. I don't think he was born as Billy Sunday, but he preached on a Sunday. I'm sure his first name was William, and he was incredibly popular as part of his celebrity culture. The other clear sign that there was a conservative backlash was something known as the Scopes Trial. How many of you in this room have heard about, oh man, evolution? How many of you have heard about evolution? Put your hands up. Let me see so I know who I'm talking to. All right. The rest of you who didn't put your hand up, either because you're tired or maybe you simply don't know, evolution is a scientific theory that argues that every animal and human being on this planet is the result of a natural evolution from a previous generation of species. And the species evolves based purely on random changes in our genetic makeup, which either give us our characteristics which make us favorable to our environment or not and then we die off okay that's natural selection evolution as theorized by Charles Darwin now the problem with that is that it goes against the biblical creation story that God created man and woman just like that no none of this evolution business where humans slowly evolved over thousands and thousands of years from apes we hear about this today in america where there's this endless debate in 2016 we are electing a new president right now the republicans are slowly figuring out who their candidate is going to be against the eventual Democratic candidate. Do you know what is the most frequent, consistent question that is asked of all of these candidates when they come together? Do you know what they're asked? Yeah? Do they believe in evolution? Do they believe in the scientific theory of evolution? All of them who have college degrees say either no I believe God created everything the Bible is literally true by the way if you believe the Bible is literally true then the earth is only 6,000 years old and it's not round that's the other candidates for high office are saying they don't believe in evolution or they're saying it's complicated the theory is still under discussion. It's not. How do these ideas surface? Because people are concerned about the scientific challenges to their religious beliefs. And politicians respond to that. But it's not a contemporary thing. In this country, there has always been a strong Christian basis to our politics. Separation of church and state, but all the politicians were Christian. And none of them were atheists. And if they were, they never said it out loud. In this country, especially in the early 20th century, there was a strong concern that as America became more modern, more different, in terms of the people coming over made it different, challenged what they believed was the core of Americanism, somebody had to stand up. In the early 1920s, there was a trial in Tennessee against John Scopes, and thus it's called the Scopes Trial. In Tennessee, you were not allowed to teach evolution, but he, John Scopes, said, well, it's science. You can believe in religion and science, and I'm teaching science. So he challenged the state law that says you can't teach evolution. He went to trial, and he lost. But... The trial showed just how touchy this issue of mixing religion and science was, and eventually it was overturned. But the very fact that he was brought to trial, and it became a national case. Some of you may not remember this. Do you remember when O.J. 
was accused of shooting his girlfriend, and there was the great car chase all the way down the highways, and every news channel was covering the great car chase. Then they were covering the court case. I'm sure you also remember when Michael Jackson had his court case. That kind of national and international attention was what the Scopes trial was over the issue of do you teach religion or science when you're talking about the origins of the species. That's how conservative America was, that this guy who wanted to teach science was arrested. And everybody wanted to know what the research, what the, I, why. The other clear sign that there was a conservative backlash in this country was the revival of the Klan. Now the Klan, white hooded, racist against virtually everybody that's not white and Protestant, they got their start in the 1870s and 80s. Their rise paralleled the rise of lynching in America, and I showed you some photos of lynching a couple of cl three classes ago. But in the 1920s, the size of the Klan exploded because there was this huge concern with this influx of new people from Eastern and Southern Europe who were not American material, and they could never become American because of their different religions, race, and cultures. Their numbers exploded to three million. And it wasn't just in the South. The Klan was everywhere. The Klan was in the North, the South, and the West. Small towns and medium-sized cities. And they hated everybody. Blacks, they always hated blacks. That was the birth of the Klan. But now their new target was the immigrants, the Jews and the Catholics. They couldn't stand the feminists because women were now challenging the old traditional ways of living. They couldn't stand the unions because the unions were against capitalism. Eventually, they lost a little bit about their popularity because in 1925, the leader of the Klan was convicted of assaulting a woman. So their claim to be saving America kind of took a hit. All of this concern with immigration, which we all just read about, eventually became law. And that is the problem with a democratic society. When the people are determined to turn their ideas into law, in a democratic society, it's going to happen. Sometimes it leads to great laws that bring freedom and liberty to people. Sometimes it turns discrimination into law. And this is what happened. In 1921, the year of this debate, the guy Parrish, who said, we can't have all these immigrants because we can't assimilate them, Congress passed a law and says, we got to temporarily stop the flow of all these immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe. We don't know what to do with them. There's too many of them coming. We can't teach them fast enough how to be American, and some of them just will never learn. Well, thereafter... This limitation of immigration was made permanent and reduced. So the flood of millions of Italians that were coming and Russians and Jews from Eastern Europe, it just pretty much slowed down to a trickle. Professor, so we're Go ahead. Are only allowing uh, like Western Europeans to come in? Or are the only ones allowed? Southern and Eastern Europeans were specifically targeted to make sure their numbers were as low as possible. French, English, Dutch, uh, Danish, Norwegians, those folks, they didn't need to come to America. The economies in their countries were just fine, or at least fine enough. Okay. How many, for those of you that are immigrants to this country, do you remember coming over? Okay, it wasn't easy, right? So imagine doing that with virtually no savings and no money. You're not going to do it unless you just got no choices left at home. All these people that came over, they came over because it was just that bad in Southern and Eastern Europe. The poor in France, the poor in England, the poor in Denmark were doing much better. Now... Asians, if you remember, were always excluded. The Chinese, permanently excluded at the early, uh, by the end of the 19th century. Even Japanese, 
even though we fought with the Japanese in World War I, we limited immigration from them. But not the Filipinos. Do you know why we allowed the Filipinos to keep coming in? Does anybody know why? Does anybody remember the Spanish-American War? Spanish-American War, we took Puerto Rico, Guam, we liberated Cuba from Spain. What else did we take from Spain? The Philippines. The Filipinos were allowed to come in because they were part of the American Empire. Just like eventually the Puerto Ricans were allowed to just come on in without at the same restrictions as other groups from the same region of the world. Mexican immigration also, this is in response to Noemi, Mexican immigration was not limited because their labor was prized in the South and the Southwest. So all this talk about we can't assimilate, we can't assimilate, America is under attack, it doesn't matter. Because if we need their labor, we bring them on in. So how did the immigrants respond to all this? These people, the nativists, the people that said, there is, an, a, there is a core group of American values and you people will never learn them. How did the immigrants respond? They said, well, Americanism has got to change. Americanism doesn't just mean white Protestant. That's what it used to mean when you didn't have all of us here. But now we're here, we're learning English, we're voting, and we're getting citizenship. So Americanism has to change. It is at this point that immigrants respond with not one Americanism, but American pluralism. Meaning, you can become an American regardless of your skin color or the God you pray to. You don't have to be white and Protestant to be an American. This is now the birth of the idea of Italian-American, Japanese-American, Mexican-American, where you can become an American but keep aspects of your heritage. Whereas the previous gen, the people that hated immigrants said, no, if you're coming here, you've got to leave everything behind. And you can only do that if you're white. If you're not white, well, you'll never be an American because you can't shed your skin color. These folks argued, no, America is all about learning its values, regardless of anything else that you all racists say. They became increasingly successful in the 1920s. They started to become more and more organized, demanding equal rights. They started suing on behalf of their particular ethnic group that was being discriminated at the workplace, in school, by government agencies. Even the Supreme Court, as it slowly evolved in the 1920s, started hearing the demands on the part of immigrants that the time for segregating them was over. For instance, there was a time in the state of Oregon where you couldn't send your kids to parochial or religious schools. It all had to be public schools because parochial schools were Catholic schools. And Catholic was a minority religion. Well, the Supreme Court says you can't do that. We are a nation of separation of church and state and religious freedom. If people want to send their kids to religious school, you don't have to pay for it, but you can't outlaw it either. Also, there was once a law in Nebraska that says you can't teach any other language but English. So you could be living in Nebraska, and if you wanted to take Spanish, Italian, Japanese, Korean, you were legally not allowed to take a class, and you certainly couldn't teach the class. Yeah? Well, here, it was not too long ago that they made the English language official. It's not official. Isn't it? I no. Like if they talk about it like it should be official, do you know why they talk about it like it should be official? What is the largest minority in this country right now? What's that? It's either right now Hispanics or will slowly become Hispanics. Many of which are recent immigrants, many of which have English as a second language, if at all. And the fear is, got to assimilate, got to assimilate. How do you do it? Make English the official language, right? That's why there's all the talk about the English being the official language. And this isn't the first time. 
<laughs> I know. It feels like it sometimes, right? But, you know, not so much. Go ahead. But for that, like, I had the same thought as you. But now, I there was a commercial. I, I'm not sure who it was, like, what company it was. But it was a commercial of a guy clearly looking either from Central or, you know, South America. The commercial was in English, but he was answering his phone in Spanish. Every time he answered his phone, it was in Spanish. Then last time I went to my bank, and there was a, a sign that said something in English, and then at the bottom it said, Ola, in yeah. Spanish. And then it says something else in English. I'm like, okay, like, what is this? Well, <laughs> bear in mind that New York City is unique, right? Only in a place like New York City, when you go to vote, they have the instructions in 27 different languages, right? And to have Spanish available as a subtitle in many places, commercial establishment, well, it makes sense because the majority of your customers are likely going to be Spanish only speaking, right? It just makes sense. If you do it down in Chinatown, there's not going to be any Spanish anywhere. Everything's in Chinese. Why? Well, because a lot of them are recent Chinese immigrants. It used to be the same thing in Little Italy until the next generation of kids, they all learned Italian, English, blah, 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 blah. Now, there was another group that started exhibiting racial or ethnic pride in the same way as Italians and Russians and Eastern Europeans, and it was African Americans. This same group that was targeted by lynchings in the South and the West and some parts of the North, this same group that was not allowed to join unions, run by whites, this same group had migrated en masse from the south to the north during World War I, and many of them had come to Harlem. And it wasn't just from the south, it was from the Caribbean, the West Indies, etc. There was this huge concentration of African Americans, West, uh, uh, West Indians, in Harlem, a, the largest concentration that that uh, neighborhood had ever seen. And the result of this huge concentration of people was both a cultural explosion, the Harlem Renaissance, an explosion of music and literature and painting from African Americans rooted in themes based on their culture, which slowly, because of its quality and sheer number, bled into and became part of mainstream of American culture. This is part and parcel of a more aggressive fight for equal rights on the legal level. So Marcus Garvey, W.E.B. Du Bois, but most importantly the NAACP, who sued on behalf of a violation of civil rights. Increasingly they were successful in the 1920s, and increasingly the Supreme Court listened to them. But the success of the new Americans came up short in 1928. In 1928, there was a presidential election. Herbert Hoover was running against the Republican, was running against Al Smith. Al Smith was a three-time governor of New York, used to be a councilman from New York City, or excuse me, uh, an assemblyman from New York City. He was a progressive. He believed in the government's regulation of the, of the economy in order to benefit workers and the poor. Most importantly, he was Catholic. Running for president in a majority Protestant nation. It was an ugly fight. He was attacked on behalf of his religion. And he lost. He lost handily. Because of this in unbelievable discrimination and fear of the new Americans the, with their Catholicism, living in the cities the, with their ethnic backgrounds. But it set up the New Deal coalition that would bring together the Catholics and the workers and the farmers and the poor and the people that believed in a progressive system of government that would elect Franklin Roosevelt, who you're reading about for your essay. And let me leave you with this, how all of this movement towards conservatism in the economy, the conservative backlash in our society, how does it come to an end? It happens with the Great Depression of October 24th, 1929, what's known as Black Thursday, where in one day, 
ten billion dollars worth of stock disappeared in one day. What does ten million dollars worth of stock mean? To, does ten million billion? Sorry, ten billion dollars worth of stock. Does it seem like a lot to you? Does ten billion seem like a lot to you right now? Yes. Ten billion dollars in 1929 in today's value is ten times more. All right. So take whatever feeling you just had, multiply it by ten, and that's how much money disappeared in a few hours in the stock market. Why did it disappear? People haven't had invested so recklessly and had artificially driven up the prices of stock to the point that they were so high that people who owned those stocks got nervous they would not rise any further. And so they started selling before the prices started to go down. Hey, Renee, put that away, please. Now, when the first group started selling, then the other groups who own stocks said, oh, Jesus, i got to sell before the price goes lower. And then you have a tidal wave of selling. And that's how you lose that $10 billion worth of money. That's $10 billion worth of stock. What does that mean in real life? Like, what does that mean, you know, stock disappears? Well, investors who had all that money in the stock market wiped out. Banks that depended on those investments closed. Companies lost all their investors, laid off workers. Unemployment went through the roof. Suicide and murder rates were the highest in American history because of this economic depression. This is some of the stuff that happened. People organized in marches, protesting the economic downturn, rallies for jobs, demanding that the government do something, help us out. The other manifestation that things were so bad and people were losing faith in the economic system of America, the Communist Party of America, which in the 1920s was minuscule because it had been so attacked by the government, it exploded in membership. Because these guys have been saying for years that capitalism is unsafe, it's bad for poor people, and it only makes a few people rich, and it hurts everybody else. In 1929, with the Great Depression, the communists were proven right. So people started joining them. Herbert Hoover, the president who got elected in 1928, and this is, well, i got three minutes left. Herbert Hoover, his solution to the economic downturn at first was do nothing. His argument was simple. Hey, you know what? Businesses. Boom, bust. Then there's boom, bust. So it's tough for a couple of years. Suck it up. We'll bounce back. We'll be even richer than before. Leave it alone. What do we do with all these people that are hurting, President Hoover? We got charities for that. The charities can help out the poor. We'll leave it like that. 1929 becomes 1930, 1930 becomes 1931, 11 million people out of work, 28,000 businesses go out of business in just one year, banks are shutting down. Finally, Hoover in 1932 realizes the government's got to do something to get the economy going again. He comes up with these solutions which give money, for instance, the Reconstruction Finance Organization. Its job was to lend money to banks, railroads, and other businesses that were critical but failing. He also offered to help people with emergency home loans before they lose their homes. This was all very good stuff. But the one thing he never did, because of his conservative, Republican, pro-business background, never give money directly to poor people. Do you know why? What? What's that? It wouldn't work. And it encouraged them to do what? Nothing. The belief was, if you give people money for no work in a time of crisis, they'll never want to work again. And that might be true for maybe a small percentage of people, but most people tend to like to work. And, you know, make more than just a government handout. So, he was stuck. The depression was getting worse and worse, and his 
political and economic thinking wouldn't allow him to get out of it. So this is where we're at by the end of the 1920s. The early 1920s was all about business. Let them do what they want. Government, don't interfere. And it's okay to interfere with people's civil liberties in order to train them to be better Americans, to purge them of their more excessive radical ideas. By the end of the 1920s, things are changing. Immigrant groups are arguing for their equal rights in the court of law and winning. Civil rights cases are being won by immigrants, eventually by unions, by blacks. The Supreme Court is recognizing the government cannot shut down differences. But most importantly, after 1929, after the Great Depression begins, the idea that American businesses know what they're doing and if you leave them alone, everybody will be okay, comes crushing to a stop. And people are looking around saying, who got us into this? The Republicans with their belief to let businesses do what they want. In 1932, there's another presidential election. Who are we going to vote for? Well, certainly not the Republicans. Because they and their thinking got it, is into this mess in the first place. What emerges in 1932 is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, governor of New York State, who claims America needs a new deal between its government and its people, a new way of thinking, government intervention in the economy to fix the economy. And that's what you're writing about for this coming Thursday. Was it, in fact, as successful as he claims it was? Thank you. And in your homework on the way out.